my presentation will also lead off from uh, Gordon's earlier this morning, but we want to try and take the next sort of logical step to ask about U.S. exports and employment, and to what extent do these offset the job losses due to imports. But let me start with some uh, familiar diagrams. Here's employment and manufacturing in the U.S. and a couple of other countries, and we start to see this substantial decline beginning around the 1990s. Surely technology is a big part of that story. And these two decades from the 1990s to 2007 or 2011 will frame uh, the studies I talk about here. Here then is uh, what happened to the share of world merchandise exports. And we can see the big rise in China accelerating after its accession to the WTO in 2001. And here then is the very familiar diagram, figure one from Autor, Dorn, and Hansen. Uh, we have the decline in manufacturing employment as a share of the working age population, uh, compared with the rise in Chinese imports as a share of US domestic consumption. Uh, and we can see Chinese imports rising. There's sort of an inflection point in 2001, just where these uh, curves have, uh, where these lines have happened across. Um, from 2001 to 2007, Chinese imports into the U.S. in fact doubled. Over that period, there was a more substantial decline in manufacturing employment. It's not really obvious from this diagram, but uh, Pearson Schott, they start off their AER paper observing that manufacturing employment was about 18 million workers, fell by 18% from 2001 to 2007, so that's somewhere in excess of 3 million workers over that narrow 2001 to 2007 time frame. And so then we have the, the question, are these related? Uh, ADH, um, sort of the, the one, a key motivation of their paper is to say, well, you can't really trust the, this time series, right? This, this time series, apparent time series correlation could be due to a lot of things. I already mentioned technological progress, reducing employment and manufacturing. And of course, that arguably did account for a big part of the surge in China too. So if we really want to isolate the impact of Chinese imports per se on employment in the US, we want to go to that commuting zone level that they do. We want to look at Chinese imports across different industries. And then we want to look at the share of employment in different commuting zones accounted for by those industries. Look at those historic shares. Those are the Bartik weights. And then we construct a kind of a, a weighted average measure of import penetration from China. And when ADH do that in a regression framework, I'll, I'll show you a, a, a regression in a minute, they get these kind of results. Not much impact in the 70s or the 80s. We start to see a, a substantial impact. This is the effect of a $1,000 per worker increase in imports from China on the change in manufacturing employment. This is as a share of the working age population. So substantial impact in both the 1990s and in this 2000 to 2007 period. But of course, it's really in the latter period, 2000 to 2007, that these imports from China are growing so much. So in the latter period, if you multiply this regression coefficient by the observed increase in Chinese imports, you get job losses of about 2 million workers and that is very substantial, right? Because the drop in manufacturing employment over this narrow period, 2001 to 2007, was somewhat over 3 million. So this 2 million drop is a lot. Uh, and it's not just in uh, a, a loss of jobs in manufacturing. You also have a shift of uh, workers to not in the labor force. So you do have a rise in unemployment, but also you have a substantial increase in workers who give up looking for a job. And finally, you do have some wage effects, surprisingly, uh, somewhat bigger wage effects outside of manufacturing in services. Uh, these, in, here in this chart, I also show you some regression coefficients on the impact of wages. Remember, this is primarily outside of manufacturing in, in services, and partly for that reason, as it turns out, that the biggest impact here is on females without college education. And I'll say a little bit more about services in a minute. Okay, so with that 
introduction, we then ask, what about exports? Right now, now Autor, Dorn, and Hansen, they did bring U.S. exports in to a limited degree because they looked not only at U.S. imports from China, they also looked at U.S. net imports from China, so imports minus exports. Uh, and they didn't actually get m m much action from comparing one with the other, from making that change. So my focus is really going to be on U.S. global exports. There's two papers I list here where we've looked at that. First one uses a, a regression framework that I'll show you, very similar to Autor, Dorn, Hansen. Second paper uses a global input-output analysis. And then thirdly, I want to come back to the question, what about other sources of consumer gains in the United States due to lower prices from China, aside from employment gains per se? So here's what happened to U.S. global exports in real term over the 1990s and 2000s. They doubled. They doubled, whether you look at 1991 to 2007 or let's skip over the global financial crisis and take it to 2011. I was recalling, didn't the Obama administration have a goal of doubling U.S. exports? Well, they did double. I don't know exactly what their time frame was, right? But, but they have doubled. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and then we also heard Chinese imports doubled over quite a short time frame, 2000 to 2007, but we sort of got a doubling in both here. Uh, you can already hear from the words I'm using, I'm okay with comparing U.S. global exports with imports from China, even though that's kind of an asymmetric comparison. I, I've been pressed to do a little bit more by referees and so on, and uh, so I have. You look at U.S. imports from other sources, it just doesn't change the picture that much, right? It's U.S. imports from China that's important. That China shock, the, the, the scale, the magnitude, the speed of that really makes a difference in the data. So I'll stick with that here uh, for this talk. And then on the export side, I mentioned and Gordon mentioned earlier, it's hard to get much impact from U.S. exports to China alone. ADH didn't find it made much difference, and part of the reason is what Gordon said. Some of those are in services or services embodied in intellectual property and so on. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I have done some work in these papers uh, uh, on, on exports to different countries, but for the most part, I will look here for my talk today, I'll be comparing U.S. global exports with imports from China. So here's what you get across commuting zones if we just look at the, the picture for a minute. Uh, it is the case, so the top one shows import penetration into different commuting zones constructed in the way that I, I referred to just a moment ago. And the bottom diagram shows export expansion or export promotion. Uh, these are exports, and this, again, is a, a, is a weighted average using your historic shares of production in industries, and then we use those to weight the, the U.S. export growth. Uh, and there, you know, visually seems like a strong correlation, but of course, really the reason, the reason for this in this diagram is I'm only looking at manufacturing imports and exports, so the lighter shaded commuting zones in either diagrams are those that don't have much manufacturing. So that's really what's dominating in both these diagrams. But still, but still, it is encouraging that lots of commuting zones that apparently experienced big import penetration from China also had the potential for export expansion via their, their manufacturing base, and in fact did achieve some export expansion is what I'm showing in the blue here. So let's look at this in a regression framework. Here's a, a sample regression in the first line here. So this is a long difference of employment over 91 to 2007 or 91 to, to 2011. Uh, it, it's actually a panel. We do 91 to, to 99, that long difference, and then 99 to the final year. We, we stack those two. Uh, there's the regression coefficients on import penetration from China in the first row. They're negative and substantial. They're actually a bit, a bit larger when you're also including the export expansion term here, which I'm doing. These are uh, positive, uh, and they're, they're more positive. They're larger in magnitude in, in the longer period, 91 to 2011, when you include those years. 
And then the other thing we can see from these diagrams, it is absolutely essential to include the lagged historic share of manufacturing employment as a control variable. If you don't include that control, you really get very small export effects here. But it ought to be in here, and that's what we just saw in the diagrams we looked at. And there's other controls in, in, included here as well. So if we take these regression coefficients and we uh, take the changes in import penetration, export expansion, add it up, what do we get? So the, uh, the, red, the, the red bars here in the bottom of this diagram are the uh, employment declines due to import penetration. So if we take that middle bar, 1999 to 2007, I, I get a, a loss in jobs in manufacturing of 2.58 million. That's a little bit bigger than, than the 2 million estimate from Autor, Dorn, and Hansen, but, but pretty close. If we extend that, however, to 2011, we get 3.2, so that's growing. Uh, if you focusing, again, on 99 through 2011, that final bar, if you compare the red with the blue, the blue are the employment gains due to U.S. global exports, you get a difference of about 1.3 million. So that's the net impact on jobs, net negative impact on jobs due to the combined surge in imports from China and U.S. global exports. So that's still pretty substantial over that later period, starting in 1999, or you could start in 2000 or 2001, wouldn't matter. But in that decade of the 2000s here, you do get this unbalanced effect. If you're willing to include the earlier decade, so if we include the 1991 through 1999 decade, right, that's where you had 2 million job growth in exports and only a 1 million job loss due to imports. So if you include that in, then the net effect over both decades, net effect of trade, is a, is a moderate net loss of 200 to 300,000 jobs in manufacturing. That is not that big. That's about one-tenth of the job loss from 2000 to 2007 alone, right? You know, so then you get a quite moderate effect. So this is kind of a textbook result, if you like, and we were, we were happy to confirm that and find it, that this U.S. export growth does offset job losses due to imports. If you look at the particular industry, so here's the first period, 1991 through 1999, these industries that declined are kind of traditional industries, miscellaneous furniture, leather, stone and glass apparel, and so on, right? Not what we think of high, as high tech or even perhaps the most dynamic industries. However, if we look at the, the second period, oh my gosh, we got electronics, machinery, transportation, uh, and so on. Computers are definitely in there within electronics. I mean, now the industries that experience this job loss are really are high technology and very dynamic industries. So the nature of the shift between these two decades is very, very different. It also turns out, if you look really carefully at um, the, these job losses and job gains by commuting zone, by decade, there's also a difference. It's really impossible to tell from looking at these diagrams, but if you do the correlation coefficient in the first decade, 1991 through 1999, correlation coefficient between the job gain and jo job loss, and these are both expressed as a percent uh, of the local population, so we are controlling to some degree for size, to some degree, right? That correlation coefficient in the first decade is 0.5, not bad, in the second decade, 1991 through 2011, it drops to 0.2. Insignificant, probably, right? 0.2. So there really was something different, uh, not only in the industries that we saw, but also in the, in the way this is spread across commuting zones between the job gains and job losses. So if I could just summarize this first paper, and then I'll go on to some others. Uh, if we look at the full two decades, the 1990s and the 2000s, we got about a, a 0.3 million net job loss due to trade. So that's, uh, that's modest. That's close to our textbook result that job gains due to exports ought to offset job losses due to imports. However, if you just look at the 2000s, post WTO accession by China, then you do get a larger loss, about 1.3 million. 
and it's in that second period, indeed, when some key industries in the United States, electronics, machinery, transport, are most impacted. And we also have a decline in this correlation of job losses and job gains by commuting zones. Okay, so in the second paper I want to talk about, we use a different methodology. We use a, a, a global input-output analysis. Probably many people here are familiar with this, but I'll just show this, this in a brief picture. Uh, in, in the upper left cell here, we'd have country A selling to country A. Those are goods from its industries going to other industries, and some of those goods from industries also go to final demand. That's another uh, sell there in the top row. But we don't stop there. We also have country A selling to country B, country A selling to China, is country C, and so on. So this is the, the global input-output analysis that most people here will be familiar with. So that's what we make use of. That's what we make use of. Uh, in, in comparison with the regression analysis of Otto Dorn Hansen, well, this is a little easier you can sort of plug it through the input-output table and you, and you sort of know you're going to get substantial effects. Uh, what do we find? We confirm two million job gains within manufacturing due to the growth in U.S. global exports and about two million in job losses due to imports from China. So they pretty much balance. But now we can really take account of services. Right, because services are in the input-output table. We don't have the difficulty of measuring them using Bartik weights and, and so on. We can just plug it through. And indeed, we find a further 4 million job gain in services due to U.S. global exports. About one-third of that comes from U.S. exports in manufacturing and those upstream linkages to service. And about two-thirds comes from U.S. exports in services and then directly impacting employment and services. So it's 4 million job gains in the service sector due to the growth of U.S. global exports in services and manufacturing. So that is really big, and there's only a very small and inconsequential job losses due to service imports. So whereas manufacturing kind of balances out, in fact, you have a huge gain in services, I'd say you've got 4 million more jobs created by U.S. exports and services through this input-output analysis. I can uh, show a few of these numbers more carefully. Um, in fact, let me just jump to this, 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 this bottom one here. Here on the, the, the first column here, in manufacturing, I got that 1.99 or 2 million job loss. And uh, in resources, I also get a half a million, uh, excuse me, 1.99 million job gain due to exports. In resources, I also have a half a million job gain. And there in services, I have the further 4 million job gains for 6.5 million in total. Balance that against the 2 million job loss um, on the import side. Uh, which is predominantly in manufacturing a little bit in, in other sectors. So again, uh, that two million job loss is, is pretty similar to what ADH find. It's, it, 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 it's fairly close to what I found in that earlier paper, but now we have this big, big gain on the export side. Okay, so if we now broaden our canvas and say, well, what about other gains aside from job gains and exports? What do we find for consumer gains? So I show one paper here with uh, Mary Amiti and Mi Dai and John Ramales. Uh, and here we look at China's boost in exports, and we argue first, actually, we, we don't think that this was only due to WTO recession, right? This was the, uh, the key variable introduced by Pierce and Schott, the reduction in uncertainty as China uh, joined the WTO, reduction in uncertainty in the United States, so it didn't have to receive an annual vote in Congress to receive normal trade relations. We find, sort of in, in contrast, that we think a big part of China's growth was due to its own reduction on tariffs on its own intermediate imports and then a productivity boost to its own <laughs> industries. In fact, we think that's just as important as the reduction in uncertainty due to WTO entry. In any case, if you put the two of these together and you say, what, what was the sort of the net impact on the United States? 
Now, we're, we're foc we are focusing here on merchandise trade, right, exclusively merchandise trade, especially manufacturing trade. But if you, you take our gains and you compare it to the entire U.S. economy, okay, then you get a reduction in a U.S. price index of one percentage point total from 2000 to 2007. That's not per year, that's total. So that's a 1% gains from trade, if you like. A Little bit smaller than some of the estimates that Steve referred to of two to 8% that you'd get for the US. I'm in fully in agreement with those. But remember, we're only looking at one small piece of trade over a narrow period, 2000 to 2007. So we find that that reduction in prices in the United States is in part due to the declines in, China, in the Chinese export prices by their own firms, but that also had a pro-competitive effect in reducing prices of other firms, U.S. firms, or other countries in the United States. And that finding is all supported, also supported by other re recent research studies. So let's take this one little piece, think about this as sort of an empirical paper, if you like. We're just trying to track those Chinese goods as they come into the U.S. What are all the price effects? And now we put that into a, a, a much more sophisticated, computable general equilibrium analysis. So here's the work by Caliendo, Dvorkin, and Perro that Gordon also referred to, forthcoming in Econometrica. So this is a computable general equilibrium. They've got 50 states, 22 sectors. So as far as they're concerned, they have 1,100 labor markets. Right is the way they think about it. And then they have a very sophisticated model of worker choice over these 1,100 labor markets. Workers face costs when moving between markets. Those could be real costs due to lost wages, but they can certainly be psychic costs. Right? It's just hard to move, it's hard to leave your industry, it's hard to leave your town. But these psychic costs can't be just anything, they're constrained by the data, right? They're disciplined by the actual mobility that we see. So it's essentially a discrete choice model of workers across the, all these regions, disciplined by the, the degree of mobility that we see across labor markets and, and regions. So they find in their study, uh, in, in the early version, 0.8 million manufacturing job losses due to the doubling of Chinese imports. They model that as a, a product, pure productivity increase, actually not as due to WTO recession, just a pure productivity increase. A little bit consistent with my work with Mary Amidi and John Ramallis that I just mentioned. Uh, in, in the more recent version, that 0.8 million manufacturing job loss is is actually shaved down to 0.55 million. So I can't really explain just standing here why this isn't 2 million, why, why don't they don't get an ADH kind of number, but bear in mind that it's a, a very, very different model. Now because they have so this sophisticated model of worker choice between regions, they have costs of unemployment. Some of these workers can choose to be not in the labor force Right? They can try and you know, match that moment. And generally, workers are unemployed for a period of time before they find something else, if they find something else. So they do get positive gains from trade. Their gains are 0 0.6, 6 tenths of 1% of GDP. But uh, that's already shaved down by one quarter due to these transitional costs of unemployment. So that knocks a quarter off your gains from trade. Without that, gains would have been closer to 1% of GDP. And indeed, they're very dispersed across regions uh, and across industries. So here's the sectoral contribution to changes, think reductions in manufacturing unemployment, furniture manufacturing, computers and electrical goods, metals, textiles to a lesser degree. So an interesting mix of both the high tech and the low tech industries they've included. And here's uh, the regional contribution to the drop in manufacturing employment. And California is the biggest due to the uh, import competition in computers and electronics, followed by Texas. And then some of those other high bars are more uh, states in the heartland. So this, is, this diagram is very influenced by the size of the state. And then my final diagram, let's, let's look at welfare changes across labor markets. Right, so these are states uh, that they're looking at here. Um, and it's a very heterogeneous response. Here I'm only looking at the positive welfare changes. 
I'm sorry, this, 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 this curve was cut off. There is a very thin and long tail of negative changes, but it's in very few regions. It's in very few regions, right? So there is a thin tail of negative regions, but in most places, they get these positive long-run effects of this China shock. So if I could just uh, try and give an overall summary. Uh, we know from the work of ADH and, and other works by those authors and others that the, the China shock ha had this effect on decreasing jobs in manufacturing. Around 2 million, if you look just at the 2000s, it's going to be somewhat bigger than that if you also include the 1990s. Uh, I'm arguing you get more or less comparable numbers and offsetting numbers, offsetting numbers, if you also look at exports, manufacturing exports, if you include service exports, then you got this pure $4 million job gain. That came from the input-output analysis. I neglected to mention I was actually surprised that, that this input-output analysis gave such similar results to a regression analysis, because the input-output analysis is really a shift in labor demand. Right? You don't have full equilibrium imposed. It's a shift in labor demand. You would have thought with upward sloping supply curves that the equilibrium changes in labor demand would be less th than the shift in labor demand, but that's not what we find empirically. We find that the results in, from the input-output analysis, the pure shift in labor demand, is pretty similar to what you just get from the data as AD ADH do from a regression analysis. Uh, if you only look at the recent period, then, in fact, exports, U.S. exports, do, do not offset the job losses. Uh, but if you're really willing to take kind of a long-run analysis, as uh, the last paper I mentioned, you do get gains in most regions. And I was reflecting on that a little bit, right? Uh, the final paper I mentioned is substantially a, a competitive model. There, there are elements of monopolistic competition, but substantially a competitive model. And, by its nature, that's going to tend to give long-run gains in many regions. So do we think this is sort of built into the model? Well, maybe, but maybe this is a very realistic description of where the U.S. economy is today. We got unemployment less than 4%. Uh, we're at the, uh, you know, at the end of a long export boom, as far as I can tell. It started earlier, but continuing to this day, stock market is booming. Uh, maybe more than any other time in the last decade or more, uh, workers are more and regions are more aware of these export opportunities, and partly because they've been chipped away by some foreign tariffs recently, right? Farmers are very aware of their reliance on exports and many, many other industries. So I think, uh, I think the question we all ask is, you know, in a month from now when we come to the midterm elections, are we going to see a different pattern of voting behavior? or a reinforcement of where we are, right? Will the current administration get credit for, for this boom, which I think started earlier, but continues to be a boom on the export side? Thank you. <laughs>